I've been too sick to feed for the past few days, so my skin is well below room temperature for my date with Jacob Keene, proprietor, and, proprietor of Keene and Sons Funeral Home, with whom I have had an appointment every Sunday night since 1966 when I opened my eyes just as he was getting ready to stick a tube in my neck, a potentially ugly situation that instead worked out to our mutual benefit. I got a steady $300 a week client, and he got a dead girl who'd never go bad. It's a fabulous arrangement, other than the fact that I have to take a cab to and from El Cerrito because Bart doesn't run after 12, and Jacob won't have me over until he's sure the apprentice of Balmer has gone upstairs for the night. This time I didn't get the go-ahead until 2.30, and now I have to deal with this irritating as fuck cab driver who, after I tell him where I'm going, launches into a monologue about how burial is environmentally unsound and everybody should be cremated. It's obviously one of his pet peeves, so I just let him rattle on and stare out the window at the endless rows of Burger Kings and tanning salons until finally we pull into the parking lot of Keenan Sons and it occurs to him that he, might have, that he might have upset me. I hope I didn't offend you or anything, he says. I tell him it's okay, like I'm on the verge of tears, which is actually almost true, because I haven't had a shot in nearly 10 hours, and my muscles are beginning to feel as though they're too short for my bones. The cab driver tries to apologize, and I throw my money at him and slam the door on my way out, figuring this way he won't have the balls to confront me when he figures out I've shorted him $5. Keenan Sons Funeral Home looks like a somber, ivy-colored international house of pancakes, a similarity made all the more striking by the fact that there is an actual international house of pancakes directly across the street. I go around back where the hearses are parked to the private entrance and ring the bell. Jacob answers the door in a tattered bathrobe that reeks of medicine and sour milk and gives me a trembling hug. Being touched makes me want to jump out of my skin. It's so good to see you, Miranda, Jacob rasps. His voice is strange and gristly through the tracheotomy bandages and his cock presses against me like a lump of damp putty, leaving a trail of pre-cum along my upper thigh. Hoping to bring matters to an early conclusion, I reach down to curl my hand around, ah, <laughs> fight with my hair here. I reach down to curl my hand around it, but, he's, but he grabs me gently by the wrist and stops me. Not yet, I'm too excited. There's someone I want you to meet first. His breath is sweet with subtle hints of decay. He ushers me down the hallway past the chapel and the display room full of gleaming coffins to the prep room in the back. There's a blonde girl lying on one of the tables, her skin grayish yellow under the fluorescent lights. This is Camille, he says, as though he were introducing us at a swing party. She killed herself. Hi, Camille. I was hoping I'd just get to fake rigor mortis for 20 minutes or so, but watching me tongue the wounds on Camille's arms gets him off almost as quickly. He's got a shriveled little mushroom of a cock that dispenses an alarming amount of semen, and of course some of it gets on me when we hug afterwards. You're so cold tonight, he mumbles into my hair, his hands like dry, brittle twigs up and down my spine. I wonder how much longer he's going to live. He's only 63, but his heart is completely shot, not a subject I really like to contemplate after more than 20 years of being guaranteed at least 1,200 a month plus access to all the formaldehyde I need to keep myself intact from now until the year 2000. He might have made some provision for me in his will, but I'm not counting on it, and it's not like I legally exist anyway. While Jacob's taking a shower, I go to the front office and call my equally decrepit dealer, Jimmy Hudson, whose attendant answers the phone and says he's had a stroke and won't be home from the hospital for at least two weeks. I try a few other numbers with no success before finally resigning myself to scoring from Alexis. I rummage through my purse until I find his card. The line is busy, so I leaf through a copy of American Funeral Director, all the first name in cremation equipment. I still haven't gotten, gotten through by the time Jacob comes to find me and drags me into the stateroom to show me Camille's coffin and rave about how her hair is going to look arranged against the quilted lilac interior until he finally pays me and I can leave. Alexis's phone is still busy, but I figure that means he's home and most likely doing business, so I call a cab anyway and have it leave me off in front of his building on 16th and Valencia. I only live a few blocks away on mission, so it's no big deal. 
I call him from the payphone on the corner and he says I can come up in five minutes, so I sit down on the steps to wait. After about 15, this old Mexican bag lady wanders up and starts staring at me. I offer her a dollar to go away, and she crosses herself and mutters the word Diablo, but keeps right on staring, the corners of her eyes caked with a gummy brownish substance that cracks a little whenever she blinks. I hate being in this neighborhood looking like something that's just clawed its way up through six feet of grave dirt, which is exactly what I look like when I let myself go to this extent, all fish belly pale with bright yellow eyes and pupils just beginning to slit. I show her my teeth just to fuck with her, and she backs up a little but will not go away. Then this ragged girl comes stumbling out of the corner store crying and clutching something clutching something wrapped in a, in a dirty white sweater to her chest. The old woman whispers in her ear and she shuffles up to me and offers me the bundle. Her nose is running and there is a plastic hospital band around her wrist. I wave her away and the old woman snatches the bundle from her and shoves it at me. Take it, Diablo, she hisses. I won't and she drops it at my feet. Glass and rotten blood, gra glass and rotten blood, pigeon from the smell of it, spray everywhere. For some reason, she was trying to give me a mason jar full of blood. Maybe she thinks I'm responsible for the girl's sickness and need to be appeased with a gift or some other such nonsense. Anyway, the girl screams and curls up in a fetal position in the gutter, and the woman drags her off down the street. I know I've seen the two of them around before, but I'm not sure where. Um, let's see... I'm not sure I wear. Um, uh, finally, Alexis buzzes me in. His fag hag, Claudia, an overweight Susie clone with, with poison rings on all of her fingers and an onk the size of a cowbell hanging from her neck, answers the door, the scent of incense and cat piss looming in the stale air behind her. Your eyes look cool like that, she mumbles. I follow, down, I follow her down the black draped hallway to the kitchen where Alexis and his boyfriend Jeremy are sitting at the table, picking listlessly at a bowl of gumdrops. They look like a pair of dissipated Perot dolls in their soiled Victorian nightshirts and yesterday's white face, hair stinking of smoke and aquanet. Sorry for the delay, says Alexis, his voice slow and smug with really good heroin. It's just that things are taking rather longer than usual this evening. Alexis fancies himself a character out of an Anne Rice novel, and right now, with my muscles stiffening, his affected speech patterns are especially annoying. I start to hand him $100, and he waves it away and unbuttons Jeremy's shirt. Just go ahead, he says. Jeremy giggles and strokes his tracked mark throat. I'd rather just shoot my own, I manage, as civilly as I can. You know my system's too fucked up to handle human blood. That's a pity, because Jeremy and I did the last of our stuff just before you came up. You're welcome to as much of it as you want, though. It's quite, quite good. He traces his veins with his fingertips. I should have known something like this was going to happen. Alexis and Jeremy are always trying to manipulate me into making them vampires. No doubt... They think they're very clever right now, having caught me jonesing my brains out with no way to get my fix except to drink their hepatitis-ridden blood. Alexis knows he's got me because there's nowhere else to go at 4 a.m. on Monday morning. Heroin dealers keep hours like bankers unless you feel like scoring a decidedly inferior product on the street. <laughs> and um, San Francisco, actually. And uh, besides, the sun is coming up in just a little over an hour. Just get me a clean razor blade and a glass. No, use your teeth. It'll just give him an infection. I don't care. Just do it. I bend over Jeremy, who is knotted out in his chair, and sink my teeth into his throat. A sudden gush of blood is lukewarm and sickening, like a mouthful of co copper-flavored castor oil. It's all I can do to keep on swallowing as Jeremy moans and shoves up against me, hands clawing at my back. Out of the corner of my eye, I can see uh, Claudia and Alexis staring in rapt fascination. After a minute or so, Jeremy's hands fall away and he goes limp beneath me. I hope he's had a tetanus shot, I gasp, struggling to keep from vomiting. I stagger backward a few steps and brace myself against the counter, feeling like some monstrous swollen tick while Claudia inspects Jeremy's throat. He's still bleeding, she says, dipping, his finger, dipping her fingers in the wound. Take him to the bathroom and clean him up, I tell Alexis. Jeremy groans and flutters his eyelids. 
as Claudia and Alexis pull him to his feet. The collar and left sleeve of his shirt are soaked with blood, and he leaves a trail of fat red droplets behind him as they drag him down the hall to the bathroom. I don't want the bleeding to stop, he whines. I want to keep on bleeding forever. Thank you.